Hey guys, welcome back to another Weird Wednesday. I'm Ashers and this is Pat O. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Good. Uh, yeah, we're recording a little bit earlier. We than are. Usual. Yeah, we are. Things have been strange for the both of us. We are both kind of dealing with like COVID things. <laughs> right it's terrible at the same time i think yeah. i think i caught covid from from you and your family <laughs> i wish uh <laughs> no i mean it was uh my kid got it at school last week and yeah. uh he came home on friday well we got notified on friday afternoon at like one o'clock that uh there had been an outbreak and of course they don't they don't tell you too much info because of hipaa and they want to protect people's privacy and they don't want kids to ostracize each other so they didn't really tell us a whole lot in the email just that an outbreak had occurred yeah and uh you know come get your kid and he'll be off for the next 10 days and uh so we went we got him we asked him like hey what's up and he goes oh i think it was this girl in the fifth grade we have recessed together and you know he's not talking to fifth grade girls at recess yeah you know, he's not talking to fifth grade girls period so i'm like okay well there's no chance you had any contact with this person and kind of went on about one on about our business this weekend that night we me and him watched uh mortal Kombat, which was pretty all right yeah you know um and he had a little bit of a fever but nothing crazy same thing saturday and uh sunday was fine and then monday we come to find out that through the parents talking to each other, not because of anything that the school released, that it wasn't somebody in the fifth grade that had it. It was someone directly in his class and that it was somebody that we knew that he was actually friends with and played with at recess. So based on that, the fact that we felt that it was a legitimate exposure and um, the fact that he did have a little bit of a fever on Friday, we went and took him. Uh, we got him. We did the rapid testing around here on uh, yesterday afternoon mm -hmm. and uh sure as shit he's got it so yeah he's covid positive and me and my wife have both been vaccinated so we're not terribly concerned but um you know i uh i still might get tested tomorrow because it um it's the responsible thing to do you know even if you if, if you've been vaccinated you could still carry it you could still what the doctor was saying yesterday was like you've been vaccinated but you've been vaccinated against SARS or something else and that you could still technically get COVID-19 so I that I wasn't in I, I didn't take him into the doctor's office to get tested that was something my wife didn't they only let one person in at a time so I didn't get the full story on that and her and I were both kind of confused but I think it's one of those things where like I don't want to compare it to AIDS, but you know, you don't necessarily die of AIDS. It's when you get AIDS, you get, you die of pneumonia or something. You mm -hmm. die of like all these other things. And I think that that's maybe how the vaccine works is that it protects you against part of the virus or part of the symptoms, but you can still get part of it or something. Well, it doesn't because it, it, your body recognizes it. So most of the time when you get things like uh, COVID-19 or when you have a fever, okay, a fever isn't caused by because of a of a virus that you have a fever sure. is your body's yeah. reaction so when people die from covid well unless they have a comorbidity like it like in my case being a diabetic the problem is if i get covid it shoots my 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 blood sugar way high my pancreas just stops working altogether, and then i get thick uh, syrup blood and that can't really move to the body and so therefore i technically i mean i guess really the diabetes kills me enough but i probably wouldn't have had that happen had i not gotten the covid you know uh, so normally and then in other cases where like it's healthy individuals that get it it's because your their body attacks itself trying to get rid of this virus and so it's and but that's why people with autoimmune issues are such such an issue because people with autoimmune issues the body will attack itself more even when they're not sick it'll constantly be under attack and so you know when you get something like a virus it could be very no matter what it is it can be very dangerous um because then your body goes into like way overdrive and it's like oh we need to live we need to live this is what's killing us it doesn't really know that it's your own cells that it's killing so um i mean that is kind of but so in the case of like a vaccine well for one the jury's still out on whether or not these variants that we have if if the vaccine protects against those right so it depends on what type of covid you have um covid19 is a variant but then it has all these like micro variants to it so it's like well but it's the same thing as like the flu vaccine people are like well i got the flu vaccine and i still got the flu yeah you can still get the flu <laughs> It's just, you know, you can. Um, however, it, it protects pretty well against it. I mean, so it's not that the chance is not there. It's just that you could 
either get a strain of flu that um, that particular vaccine doesn't protect, or you can still just straight up get the flu and your body is not going to overreact because it's seen it before. You know, it's just like having someone knock on your door. If a stranger knocks on your door, okay, you're like, who the fuck is this? Why? Why is this person at my house? Who is this? But if your buddy comes over to your house, you know who they are. You've seen them before. You recognize them. So you're not as alarmed. It's, it's the same concept. It's just, you know, cells. <laughs> you can tell your mom's a nurse. Uh, she's not a nurse. <laughs> she's, a, she's a medical lab tech, but. <laughs> uh, whatever. It, it, it's nice. I'm glad that we have this aspect of the show. People <laughs> that know what the fuck they're talking about when it comes to that. So they're just. <laughs> fucking made up monsters and shit i took two but, years of anatomy and physiology also i love that shit <laughs> i i don't know if i remember this i took microbiology as well because i heard that it was that's where all the nursing students were yeah <laughs> so that was my that was my lab course and uh it did not work out very well for me <laughs> oh. <laughs> but whatever I, I i know what a lipid is i think <laughs> it's, a, it's a fatty uh sugar thing <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that much. All right, I whatever. But I are no, like, that's good. And I'm definitely getting tested tomorrow, too. Thank you. That that solidified it for me. Yeah, definitely go ahead and get tested. I mean, because there are still people, well, like me, who I'm not eligible for the vaccine yet. And now I'm in this predicament where I, I think that I may have COVID because I'm having symptoms. But I don't know. You know, we were just talking. I mentioned, you know, it, it could be the shitty Midwestern weather that's causing an allergy flare up, which I don't typically I don't typically have allergy issues um, or, you know, it, it could be COVID or it could be something else entirely. Um, but, right. you know, I, I got tested because that's the right thing to do. And, you know, that's especially for somebody like me who needs to be extra cautious. And, you know, if, if I do have it, it's better to know early on than to wait until it gets worse because it can get bad quick. So, you know, yeah. that kind of. um kind of where i'm at today but yeah that's been uh that's been what's going on uh in this in this world i didn't really uh do anything exciting for the weekend but but i do have something exciting to share um <laughs> remember how we've been talking about these cattle mutilations lately yeah there's more <laughs> it's still happening um it's still you know well which i, I guess in in oregon it's kind of just been the popular thing to do i guess is is to mutilate cattle i don't know it's but the the cases are still they're still steady they're not slowing down um so now they've had people um looking more into it there's a full investigation into these mutilations and a little bit more information has come out um a uh cattle vet has looked into them has been looking into them and she's saying that these are not natural causes of death so a couple of things to note what they're finding in these and and so when we talk about cattle there it is cow that's being mutilated um the typical you know missing eyeballs missing tongues missing rectums um but then other things like the reproductive organs are gone without an incision being made i'm assuming that this is in the same case as with missing rectum so maybe they're removing them that way i mean that's some way they got to be removing them um random patches of hair missing but not like just kind of patchy hair these are like precise squares of hair missing in different spots um bite marks uh but 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 no blood no blood in these things so just a lot of really weird stuff um some of them have pinpricks and certain parts of their body um so there are a lot of people you know the skeptics are out in full force with this one of course they say that these things are typical with um predatory uh you know birds um that that are scavengers you know however that doesn't account for the missing patches of hair and you know how the fuck is a bird going to remove reproductive organs with no incisions that's just not possible <laughs> So that is kind of what's going on. There's just kind of more and more happening. Um, and then the, you know, the headless seals uh, situation is still. <laughs> I remember still... that one. Oh, you remember them? Do you? <laughs> uh. They are still um, up for debate. Now, this is just, I don't think anything new has happened since last week. Um, not as far as I've seen. However, now it's kind of become like my own personal rabbit hole. And so there are these you know neat folks that i talk to again if you follow me on social medias you probably already have a pretty good idea i i use the clubhouse app a lot and i am on there 
with the um, Bigfoot Society podcast folks and then a bunch of other great cryptozoologists. And um, we also have a Discord server where we kind of discuss upcoming shows and things like that. But that's where really we'll like, so Saturdays we have something called Five Minute Cryptid News and we all kind of bring our own stories and we kind of talk about the news and whatnot on every Saturday at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern on Clubhouse. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm plugging on my own show. That's, <laughs> that's really... <laughs> that's hilarious anyway so we post the articles there i posted the headless seals article and somebody else had mentioned that that was interesting because they had a guy who was also um had a big concern with these headless seals coming up on shore he's he's found them in the same area and um you know there was other stuff that the guy the guy claims that he caught a video of a dragon and it's not it's just a dragonfly i mean it looks exactly like a dragonfly he says it's a baby dragon he's weird but you know that's still i mean but that still doesn't account for why he's finding headless seals so right you know i don't know i just think it's getting closer and closer pat i think we need to do this uh cattle mutilation episode soon yeah i'm down for that that's <laughs> that's been on our that's been on our short list for a while yeah it definitely has and it's just it seems to start being more and more relevant so i mean i'm definitely down to talk about it but that's really all the news that I have this week. Do you have anything to share? Uh, yeah, I guess two updates. I, I we supposed to be having another interview with uh, um, the person that we talked about last week with the uh, with the Masonic temples and the mass shootings and all that stuff. Uh, an update to that story is that they they claim there was a fire uh, behind their yeah. parents' house last week um they had spent all week out of town visiting their family which is the same area kenosha wisconsin where where all this the stuff is supposedly going on and when they left town um that like afternoon they left town to head back towards my neck of the woods um that that night a fire had broken out behind their parents house and they, they sent pictures and and you know chat logs which of course all that stuff can be faked but it seemed legit you know um i did try to look it up in the news but it didn't necessarily make the news but that's you know like you pointed out any you know sometimes you'd be surprised what finds yeah. its way into the paper what and what doesn't, doesn't yeah so um that thing is still ongoing and we're actually uh me and Astrid are supposed to have a call with them and i'm excited the next, yeah with the next day or two to kind of keep unraveling that stuff because that is uh that's you know, it definitely could be something. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, I also I follow this person also on social media and they had mentioned this on, on social media that this fire had happened. And, you know, what was really telling to me was that they kind of, you know, they, they, they were lucid enough to say that, you know, either this is just crazy life coincidence and life just sucks sometimes like or this is a big, you know, threat by the D.A. and, and all this. Right. And, you know what I mean? But they were able to actually kind of know that there's a difference between the two and so you know i so i don't know i i'm very interested um you know pat was the one that spoke with this individual i have not spoken with this individual except for like in passing just on twitter um but not like directly so i'm excited to see what what comes out of this um because you know this the, I, i've heard a lot of stuff you know I, i've i've heard the the original phone call and whatnot but um you know i definitely still have a lot more questions so we'll see uh how that yeah, continues I and I mean, so today's show topic, as you could tell from the title, I know what it is this time. You know, do you? Uh, <laughs> is uh, we're doing the Manson family uh, stuff, and the book that I read um, that I'll be referencing today. You know, it took the author twenty years to write, and it just kind of put keeping that in perspective with this thing is like, okay, so somebody tried to write this like the definitive book about you know, the Manson family killings yeah. and it took him 20 years. If it takes us three weeks and two telephone calls <laughs> to get this show topic nailed away, I think that's a fair amount of research. Yeah. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like not everything comes to you neatly gift wrapped with, with everything included in a little box. Sometimes it takes a little bit and you have to do a couple calls and you have to do a little digging and then you get the story uh, or you find out there is no story. Yeah. And you're fucking well, there. and I was kind of saying that today. Um, I'm sure you saw Pat and I were, we're friends on Facebook, so it's official. Um, but, <laughs> 
but you know, I post, I shared a memory from last year, right. Talking about my documentary. I was so proud yeah. of this specific individual come on. And you know, it just kind of like hit me that like, shit, it's been a year since like that happened. And then I'm like, you know, while I'm like sharing this status update and like kind of adding more to it, I'm like, kind of disappointed in myself like what the fuck i haven't got this documentary out yet like man i've been promising there's a people. fucking pandemic <laughs> well there, and there is, right. you're right you're right there's a pandemic and, and it is an ongoing investigation like it's not this right. is probably not something that i will ever stop i will probably never stop chasing the mothman for the rest of my life unless i find him you know and, and in which case great wonderful but if i don't I will probably still continue to chase them for the rest of my life. And so making a documentary on an ongoing investigation, I mean, yes, I could just I, I could just repeat the story of Point Pleasant and point out the same shit that everybody else has, but you know, that's not what I'm doing. So <laughs> you know, but sometimes these things, you know, they take a while. You mentioned this guy, you know, it took him a while to do this. Investigations aren't just like cut and dry. I mean, people don't realize, you know, how much work actually goes into each individual person and their individual stories sometimes it's just a random email that you get and you're like oh hey i you know i saw the the duhan like the one guy or you know sometimes it's it's fucking uh chad and alta who have had a lifetime of of high strangeness and you just can't possibly sit down and get the full story in, in one go it's gonna take a long time which hopefully i'm gonna have them on the show very soon it's just that i have to unpack what it is they're telling me first <laughs> before i can bring it to you guys so you know it just it just depends it just depends um you know with uh with this individual you know in question are we going to know more definitively after the phone call tomorrow you know in my own personal experience probably not no um we'll know a little bit more but are are we gonna hit the finish line eh, probably not it just depends if more stuff continues to happen especially because we're seeing this in real time um you know but it, it'll be fun it'll, i'm looking forward to it um you know that's that's why i do what i do i love investigating so <laughs> well i'm gonna let you in on a little secret Ooh. every single uh substantial substantial literary work that i've completed manuscripts whatever uh i've done during national novel writing month and I'd say about 90% of the short films that I've made, I've done uh, four festivals or um, competitions where there was a, a deadline involved. Okay. Uh, you know, I operate very well with, uh, d like, defined yeah. pass or fail deadlines. Yeah. Where either you get it done by the 5th or you don't get it done. And uh, that I, I've realized about myself is that I work very well within that structure. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for deadlines and me getting shit done by having having to have things done, you know, not like I'm setting yeah. a deadline for myself, like I'm going to get this thing written by the end of the weekend. No, 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 no. Because I fucking don't care about that. But if it's like I'm involved with something that gives me a deadline where I have to have it done by a certain date, then I find myself, I apply myself more to get it done by then. So, um you know, I think that's, that's just part, and I'm not, not to compare myself to you, like, in a, no, you know, yeah. to point me out, but like, that's, that's the only reason I've gotten shit done is because I've, I've, I've put myself in positions where I had to, or I had to clear cut admit defeat, but I don't think that applies to you in this situation, you know? Um, I mean, I, I need to, I need to really, like, I know for sure that there are two and it doesn't like when I put it in this way, it's not that bad. There are two major things that we need to hit before we are ready to put this documentary into post. And that is a Chicago investigation. And that is also speaking with Tanya Derenberger. Now, I can't make Tanya talk to me. She says she wants to, uh, but she has MS and she's old and it's we have we have a pandemic going on right so <laughs> but now that it's getting like nice outside i would like to see if i could like set up some type of outside meeting with her because when i initially asked her it was starting to be kind of fall so now that you know we're getting we're getting back into like nicer weather then i can set that up with her and then of course we just have to set a date for the chicago thing and, and go out and do it those are the two major things that i feel like need to happen before this is finished because that was the dream in the first place was that this was not just going to be one documentary it's going to be a series of documentaries about different things and so we're kind of starting to like so like we've been talking about going to kentucky and you know investigating there and doing this and that and, and the other but that's a whole nother documentary that has nothing to do with mothman <laughs> it does i mean that's kind of the point of the documentary that's kind of is to show that all these things are synced together um but you know this one just this one is about mothman so i need to like 
just really focus in on, on what that is and what that means and then you know take it from there but i agree with the deadline thing i like deadlines that's why i do yeah. this podcast every single week because if <laughs> i just did it whenever you know it would never get done and that's so that's very true it's very very true <laughs> And if I get lazy and I'm like, oh, no, I can just skip that week, then I'm going to skip the next and the, and the next. And, exactly. the and so therefore, you know, I'm not going to be I can't just can't be that person because I do like a good deadline. Now, that's really hard to do when you work for yourself. <laughs> so, yeah. oh, I'm very persuasive when it comes to convincing myself that something doesn't matter. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yes. That. I will choose laziness every time. Um, but you know, the, the downfall to that is that on the flip side, I don't get downtime. I really, really, I am always fucking working on something. Um, and I don't know if that's because like in my head, I have set little deadlines for these things, little specific things. Like I said, Tuesday, you know, Tuesday's always our podcast day. I've got another podcast that I record on Wednesdays over on clubhouse. I've got other clubhouse things. Like I know that that's going to happen at that day and time. Right. So that's, I have to work my life around that um and then so in the meantime then i'm like well i got all the shit that i have to do what do i do and i just kind of start working on a little bit of everything at once and i don't recommend it <laughs> so <clears throat> sorry my voice is going to be like sound like shit because i'm i'm flimmy and i'm sick and it sucks so just deal with it this week uh, it makes you sound like jessica rabbit <laughs> well okay i'll take it so anyway um anyway now that we've we've gone off on that tangent so do you did you have anything else you wanted to share no, I got so I mean, I, I guess just to tease it out, because it'll happen at some point and hopefully motivate you to fucking get your shit together. Uh, so Asher said, uh, brought up the idea of doing a uh, uh, like ancestry episode, yes. where we were, we were both going to get uh, DNA tests, and then compare the results. And I ran out and did mine. And hers is sitting in the box on her counter. My result. <laughs> Is that this is my result? I got mine back. My result okay. is that I'm a lazy fuck. That's what it is. <laughs> no, I understand. But uh, I got mine back, and they came in last night. And I, uh, ooh, I got lots to talk about. But I don't want to ruin the show, so I, I feel like I'm just gonna I'm gonna internalize it all for the time being. I already, you know, fucking bothered my wife about it this morning, and I'm still waiting to hear back from my sister. But uh, yeah, I was like, it, there was, it was just be prepared for a hornet's nest because I, uh, I got mine last night and I'm not I'm happy so, with it. I'm, I'm so all, nervous now. I don't know what this I'm, is. I'm also not 100% and this is something else we'll go into in the show, but I'm not 100% sure of the accuracy of it because I'll just, I'll just give, I'll just give one thing away uh, just because I hate to be a complete and total cock tease um they they go through your uh like physical genetic traits that you should or should not have exhibited right mm -hmm. based on your genetic makeup there is a 76 percent chance that you have or do not have this specific trait right and one of mine was uh back hair and it said that i was i was you know a very high percentage likelihood that i would not have back hair and i am completely fucking covered in hair You're a bear <laughs> from head to fucking toe everywhere and i just looked at that and there was there was others too and i could go down the list and be like i was reading to my mom this morning and she was cracking up um but i think that that those being a little off gives me hope that there was other aspects of it that were a little off as well um but that's something to be you know but i will say this there was an amazing synchronicity that happened because we used the test that you suggested if i had gone with the test that i was going to get half of half of what i would talk about would not be there um but okay. so it was it was it was crazy that you suggested this one you said no no this is the one we're going to use go buy this one and i did it and it made all the difference in the world in a certain respect so uh wow. yeah i'm gonna leave the audience hanging and hopefully that motivates you to spit in the fucking tube <laughs> <laughs> and walk it into the fucking post office you know because it took about two weeks like you can go back and check the show notes but like it didn't take that long actually i was really surprised because it says like six weeks or so it yeah no 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 it was telling me it would be ready by may 3rd to may 13th and it was ready on april 26th oh, so it was early yeah so it was quick and if you download the app which obviously you're gonna do um and yeah you check along with it every step of the way. It says like, oh, hey, look, it, it arrived at our carrier facility. Oh, look, we, we're sequencing the genomes now. Like, 
it walks you through everything. And then when you go to look at the info for, I mean, they email you the shit too. Yeah. Once it's done, they email you the reports, but you can check it all via the app. So you can do screen grabs and show people like, look what this fucking says. I'm um, excited to see what mine says, but now I have to wait for my COVID test to come back. So, <laughs> so we'll see. Hopefully this week. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> one of these days guys one of these it's okay we got a bunch of great wonderful guests lined up for the next couple of weeks actually so yeah we're um, in a good place yeah it, right so it'll be you guys will be happy anyway and then you get to have the boring genealogy episode i guess and maybe you don't find it boring i don't know i think it's interesting um but you know who knows <laughs> we'll see what people think um but i'm excited i'm excited to find out what you found out i'm excited to find out whatever it is i'm gonna find out and uh i can't wait so i think it'll be fun um well, we'll see. I, I tell you what, mine's probably going to say that like there's a seventy percent chance that I should have had red hair, and that's not natural. It's, no. What made you pick red then? You really didn't know that my hair wasn't really red. I'm confused by by uh, wigs and eyelashes. <laughs> What's confusing about them? You put them on. <laughs> I know, but I don't know when girls are wearing. I was at. I was at a bar one. This one actually wasn't too long ago. I was at a bar with some people, and it was a friend of a friend. And we were sitting there, and we were all just talking. And this other person walked up to this girl that we were sitting with and said, hey, do you have any eyelash glue? And my, one of mine's coming off. And the girl said, no, these are actually magnetic. And the conversation that they had was blowing my fucking mind because I was like, wait a minute. You're both wearing fake eyelashes, but one of yours is coming off, and you got fucking magnets holding yours on? <laughs> Holy shit. I had no idea what the fuck was happening. And um, I worked, when I worked in the hotel industry, there was, you know, the girls at the front desk, the, the popular ones at least, were very attractive women. They were always very well coiffed. Sure. And uh, they would wear, like, wigs. And I had I was like, you change your hair a lot. Huh? Your hair looks really good today. You're like, oh, my God, you dyed your hair. And she's like, had its wig I'm like, get the fuck out of here like what do you look like underneath that like it's just the the transformative nature of women sometimes like really throws me for fucking loop. <laughs> so <laughs> my so, like, not that bad i can say okay. that a lot of a lot of women uh you know they are they do look you know drastically different between like their when they have their face on that's what i call it my face when they have their face on and they have their face off which you know as as people have seen on my social media is like i i don't mind posting a picture of myself with no makeup on like yeah I, but that's great. but that's not what i'm talking about i i your, your hair is i didn't know that you dyed your hair so my hair um which i'm really surprised that you didn't know that i, I don't know well because i'll post pictures of my roots are showing now see well my roots that's the thing so okay so i'm naturally blonde like white blonde like stark Whoa. white blonde. yeah yeah that's why i draw my eyebrows on because i'm pretty they're pretty much non-existent if i don't right so it looks kind of strange you know if i don't have them on and i have eyebrows i you know i have them you just can't they're so white you can't see them all my body hair is completely white i don't have to shave if i don't want to <laughs> because you can't see it and uh you know but no my hair is not my hair is uh my hair is blonde naturally blonde i have not actually seen my natural hair color since i was pregnant and that was almost 10 years ago and um except for my roots so my roots will come out and then when my roots start coming out then my hair you know the red kind of fade it starts to fade and it kind of becomes more of like an orangey color and uh when i go out and about people always people compliment me more my roots are growing out than when i freshly dye it because my they think that like the roots are on purpose and it's weird and it's not and i'm just like no girl this is just called i'm lazy and didn't do my hair um <laughs> they seem to like it now i I, cho I didn't i didn't choose the red life red chose me uh this is what i tell people all the time which apparently is a south park joke and i didn't know it um but i tell people i'm transgender because i should have been born a redhead because i have a redheaded personality so <laughs> But no, it's not real. Of course, it's not fucking real. The devil's daughter. <laughs> That's me. So, but it's okay. I have been adopted. Like I have actual like ginger friends, and they've like ad ad adopted me. They're like, oh no, you're fine. You're part of the family. Well, our good friend, uh, the Reverend, uh, you know, Crimson Nicholas. He's 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 a ginger, and you know, he's accepted me. So, <laughs> did you post that Lucille Ball quote no. about a man? A man should know the love of a redhead woman at least every man should know the love of a redhead woman no, I've never heard at this. least once in his life yeah it was i i almost reposted it because i've i've known the insides of a couple and <laughs> <sweet>. <laughs> that's gross <laughs> 
no devil's daughter but, man. you know what hey you, that's a really good point i mean and, and i understand you know I, I i like the appeal of being a redhead it's just kind of a whole you know once you choose to do that it just becomes like a lifestyle and now for a while i was changing it i, I was going purple in the winter time and then once like the warmer ones you know i would do red um but the last time i did every time i do the purple like every time i do any other color besides red, because i have dyed it other colors it, it just does i don't feel like me i don't feel like i'm you know in in my own skin and like you know now at this point and we were talking about this when we did the uh the chucky and tiffany photo shoot um because the uh photographer also like she dresses up more than anything more than taking pictures she dresses up and we were talking about like dressing up and she had like some suggestion with something that i should do and i'm like yeah but then i have to like either get a wig or dye my hair and i can't dye my hair because i'm i'm a red that's what everybody knows me it's like my calling card i got red hair <laughs> so <laughs> yeah it's kind of weird now to think of me to, as not having red hair but but no it's fake <laughs> purple purple i'm not a fan of just because it always comes across as black to me like it's always too dark maybe that's based on part of part of the problem is that i'm a little bit colorblind so like i oh. see, see shit a little off but yeah the purple never really looks like purple when i think of purple i think of grimace and when when i think you know what i mean like grimace grim, grim, is sexy <laughs> grimace no no i mean like that color purple and when oh. girls dye their hair purple it's usually like it's like a like a little bit lighter than black like it always just seems black to me yeah it always just looks black and yeah. uh you know i do like i do like a good uh like electric blue bob wig oh yeah i think those are nice yeah well i mean i used to dye my hair all kinds of colors and you know eventually i landed on uh it, it was before i would like dye my hair different colors but i'd always land back on black and even though i kind of miss having the black hair um because i had more of like the elvira morticia adams kind of aesthetic going on there <clears throat> i don't feel like i look nearly as goth with my red hair as weird as that might seem that's just how i feel and so um you know back then i would i would do the black hair but then i change it i mean i've done everything i like the pastel colors but they're hard to match eyebrows too and so that's difficult because when you ch again when you change your hair you gotta change your eyebrows and it has been a science to get the the perfect color of eyebrow for myself <laughs> i used to have blue hair or bleach my hair and do it i was younger do it again uh, do it now. i don't have enough hair now <laughs> right the rest of it just falls out it's like nope. no unless i do my back hair my shoulder hair yeah you should. to match you're worried about matching your eyebrows trying to match your shoulders <laughs> you should. we should we'll dye it all blue oh, God. we'll dye it all purple you look like grimace <laughs> <laughs> oh all right that's enough of that that's not what the people are here for the people are here for something very specific this week sure um which I'm excited to talk about. So last week we kind of gave you guys a tease. Um, sorry we got high. Um <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm I'll do it again too. Right, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it'll happen again. Um, you know, we got high, we kind of just got talking about the news. It was just kind of a free-for-all kind of a round table episode, which is fine. We don't really get to do those often. So, you know, it was kind of nice to just kind of talk about whatever. But um you know it, it is still april this will be the last episode in april and this is going to wrap up our theme of of drugs this month mm -hmm. and um i'm excited about it so you know we, we were talking about charles manson and the manson family and we were just kind of talking about um the, the kind of the times and how they were you know kind of it was you know the 60s so everybody's all into this love and peace and and sex and um you know drugs <laughs> <laughs> so pat's been reading this book uh pat do you want to talk about the book a little bit it is called chaos charles manson the cia and the secret history of the 60s yeah so the reason why we kind of brought this up was because right before the manson episode we talked about mk ultra and right. mk ultra is a very real thing that happened um where the government were was experimenting with drugs and in, in many different ways um they were experimenting to try to make um kind of super soldiers or super assassins with drugs um they were experimenting with um i know there was you know definitely um different illnesses to try to treat with drugs and uh they were experimenting with torture and drugs all kinds of stuff with drugs um for about at minimum uh what like 20 years <laughs> i mean at minimum right it's probably still going on um 
so we kind of got on the topic of of Manson a little bit. Now, um, Manson has a really, uh, you know, man, everybody knows that that the Manson family were at Spawn Ranch doing a bunch of drugs, right? And a lot of people believe that the reason why <clears throat> it was so easy for Manson to cultivate a cult, I guess, um, was because these people were under the influence of drugs for the most part, and they were dependent. Um, and, you know, he was able to kind of to brainwash them using drugs. And again, that's kind of what MKUltra was all about, was brainwashing people using drugs. Um, but what if what if it was, a, you know, what if it was Manson? What, what if Manson was the one that was actually brainwashed? You know, and that's kind of what we're going to get into. I guess I don't know exactly. I did read the book, so I don't know. I finished it today, and it was fucking long and i'm glad that we can we can do i finished it we can do this episode i can put it on the shelf and i could start reading starship troopers i'm <laughs> dying to fucking read that book but obviously you can only read one book at a time sure. um yeah i mean I, so here's the deal i when i was reading this thing i almost wanted to like be taking like notes so that when we did this episode i could um like reference like mm-hmm. like just go through everything and do specific dates and and people's names and and acronyms because there's so many acronyms and like all different kinds of shit and i thought that you know what if i did that i'd be doing a disservice to the author uh whose name is tom (laughs) o'neill and uh i think that honestly i'm gonna give you a very fuzzy around the edges i'm gonna give you i'm gonna give you more info than you had coming into this show but as far as the specifics of the details I, I do want to encourage our audience to pick up this book and read it because you had we had talked about this yes. before and you were like, oh, that book's 50 bucks. I don't know what the fuck you were looking at. I got this thing for like 15 off Amazon. Yeah, I don't uh, know why it showed up for me. It was like 50 something dollars. It was weird. Yeah, maybe it was a first edition or a hardcover or some shit. It but could have been. I got the soft cover off Amazon for 15 bucks and it showed up at my house in two days. So if you're interested in any of this stuff and what's crazy about this book, once again, just giving a kind of an overview is that it was it was really like a perfect read for me because i am into the manson stuff i'm into the lurid polanski sex shit from the 60s i'm into the cia stuff and i'm into the mk ultra shit and i think that if you were only interested in one aspect of the story you might find the other aspects tedious but because all of this stuff is shit that interests me yeah it was like I was constantly engaged. There was const- I'm constantly learning new stuff about shit that I care about. Right. Um, I don't read a whole lot of new fiction or nonfiction unless it's like the biography or an autobiography of somebody that I particularly am interested in. Um, unfortunately, I don't read a lot of true crime, and this book may actually change that if it's cases that I'm super drawn to, um, yeah. which I now realize involve copious amounts of sex and drugs. But uh, – I will say this, like this book is worth checking out. So if I, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to outline the whole entire book and then regurgitate it on the podcast and, and ruin sure. everything in it. Sure. Fucking read it. It's $15. S- start an OnlyFans for a month and you'll have enough and go out and buy it and it'll be money well spent. Because uh, it was very educational. Very, 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 very. I mean, the Kennedy assassination, there's an entire chapter on that and how that factors into all this, uh, which wow. I mean, well, yes, which I, I, and the author even says, I, I, when I saw it going down this rabbit hole, I pray to God that it wouldn't take me here because now everyone would think I'm really fucking crazy. And it went down there and it was completely legit. And he's got, he's got, everything's backed up. Everything's referenced. He's got, uh, there's no conjecture in here unless it's clearly outlined as such. Right. You know what I mean? This was a meticulously researched, you know, for 20 fucking year book. Uh, he started, he started uh, working on an article for Premier Magazine in around 1999 for the 30th anniversary of the uh killings and the book didn't come out until 2019 because it took him 20 years to get everything get his facts straight and shit and it was worth it so and and who now who is this guy what does he do you know what he does for i mean does he does he do what does he do anything for a living well, for the past 20 years he's been writing this book <laughs> well, besides so, <laughs> books. yeah no well that was it i mean that and that and that's kind of part of like the subplot of this book is how this whole thing took over his life um so yeah originally he was kind of he he was a he was a he was a journalist that wrote for like the village voice and the new york times and premier magazine and they just threw him this fluff piece hey we're coming up on 
the 30th anniversary of the Manson family murders, can you do a, a relatively small article about uh, the the after a shot after shocks fell through Hollywood and the way it changed the scene and uh, you know some of the people that are still that were still active in Hollywood at the time yeah were, were around back then they were young stars Jack Nicholson Warren Beatty Candice Bergen uh, the Beach Boys stuff like that like you could find these people you can go talk to these people and when he started to do that he started to realize like no one wanted to talk about it and things started to he started to kind of unravel and find inconsistencies with this with the case and that he kept digging and premier magazine uh gave him extensions because they saw they believed in the story and he was finding good evidence and then uh eventually it outgrew premier magazine and he had a publisher giving him money to research it and then that kind of fell apart uh in like the last leg of it and his parents had to basically um you know, loan him money so that he could finish doing his research. And he did. And obviously now the book's out, but, uh, it was a long fucking, he, he literally spent 20 years of his life doing nothing but working on this case wow. and filing freedom of information act requests yeah. and interviewing people and going all over the United States and abroad and trying to track down these people and where they moved to and all this stuff. And, uh, it shows it's a crazy fucking story. It's a crazy story. Okay. And I wouldn't even, I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about like the bigger picture and then I fill in the blanks. So I don't know how you want to do this. Well, I mean, so, <clears throat> so the first instance where I had where I thought that, and because I don't know exactly um, the details, I guess, is, is kind of what I'm getting at. But the first instance that I had where Charles Manson may have been wrongfully convicted um, is, was in the fact that, um, he was he was engaged to um that girl what was her name afton something um i can't remember her name and i really should know her name right now hold on one second i'm gonna pull it up <sighs> darn it come on where is it no i don't want any of that right now jesus you should have taken fucking notes i know i should have <laughs> i had it i had it pulled up i was doing the right thing but then i got covid sick afton burton that's her fucking name and she started speaking to Charles Manson when she was 17 years old. And um, back in, I think, 2014 or 2015, kind of in recent years, um, you know, there was there was this big announcement that they were engaged and they were going to get married. And, you know, people were like, why? But she wouldn't really come out and talk about it. So eventually um, they, they launched this website and um, she did start talking about it. She was like, well... You know, the reason why we're getting married is because I believe that he's innocent. We have proof to back up the fact that he's innocent. And in order for me to access the records that I need to access to, you know, get him set free, we have to be married. And I just thought that this was crazy. You know, and you see this shit all the time. There's a lot of women that fall for like these crazy killers and stuff like that. That's yeah. not unheard of. I mean, it's gross, but it happens. Um, and especially her she definitely seemed like you know she was attention sinking like she, her 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 name was afton which is a weird name to begin with but she changed it to star and was going by star and you know so she just seemed like one of those people but then they launched the website and i remember like kind of in real time viewing this website um and they were discussing different aspects about the case that were incorrect so the claim that they were making was that charles manson um had absolutely nothing to do with these murders um that uh tex had most everything to do with with the murders for the most part which it, i don't know if you know anything about prison life unfortunately i know a lot about prison life and um every single person in prison is innocent um right. i didn't know if you knew that or not but that's what they, they all say that i didn't do this um but you know the claim was that the reason why they used charles manson was because he was so i don't want to say woke but <laughs> he was so woke and he had such visions i mean people really did think that he was some type of prophet and, you know, this person kind of believed that he may have been and that he was a threat to security and that he was a political prisoner. And they were just simply trying to make an example out of him um, because they needed to silence him and needed to silence the rest of the movement. So, like I said, I don't know if the book talks about anything like any of that. I mean, no, it doesn't bring up the website at all, but I'm I'm interested to see when the website went live 
Um, well, so so I had a really hard time finding that website. Okay, now it's MansonDirect.com. Manson Direct. Okay, well, how did you find it so easily? I don't know. Like, I'm very good at using Google after being on a show with you for about a year now. <laughs> I was trying to find it before this and I couldn't find it anywhere and I don't know why. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was a lot of, of really, um, I guess it was mansondirect.com. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that is it. Um, <clears throat> but we had just kind of touched on it a little bit, but no, this was a big, um, this was a big thing. And, you know, it, it had a lot to do with, um, Ottawa, his, his organization, um, which was, um, what air trees, water and animals or something. It's just like a environmental and friendly organization. Um, and you know, that he believed in protecting the environment. Uh, Manson didn't believe in things like electricity and, you know, so at least not like the way that we get it now and stuff like that. Um, so it, it was, it was really kind of interesting to see because it, it became like a, a conspiracy in and of its own self, because then when you go back and you look at the evidence and because I couldn't find the damn website, I wasn't able to do that. But like one of the main pieces of evidence there was the fact that he wasn't allowed to speak at his own trial. And that is weird. Right. Like, um, that was very suspect so that was kind of the first uh, that was kind of my first run in with thinking that maybe manson is not this crazy evil guy and you and i have personally you know off the record discussed maybe you and i have i'm pretty sure you and i have we've discussed these very mentally ill ill people because when you listen to, to charles manson talk he sounds nuts right he does he's right. really crazy but we've kind of talked about what if these people aren't crazy well, my take on him is that he's definitely fucking nuts. Um, he had the, the he had a long violent history that predated anything having to do with California or uh, the hippie movement or drug yeah, use. He did, um, you know, and and he, you know, he had a fucked up childhood. He had a fucked up childhood. He was in a, he was in and out of foster homes. He was sexually abused in the foster homes by the other boys. Uh, right before he kind of became the Charles Manson that we know now. Um, he was in uh, Joliet prison, actually in Illinois yeah. for uh, I think like some kind of, and all his crimes were federal too. Uh, that, I mean, that's how big they were, but he like, he fucking like raping men. Like he was just like, he was, he was fucking all over the place. And uh, I guess kind of to tell, to tell this, the story of the book chronologically, where things get really hinky with him is in the mid sixties, uh, he gets transferred from, um, he gets released from jail in California and breaks parole and he gets, he gets released in Los Angeles and, uh, is told not to leave Los Angeles and goes directly to San Francisco when this is during the summer of love, hey, Ashbury, right. Hey, day. And uh, checks in with a PO officer in San Francisco by the name of Roger Smith. And uh, that's when things start to get weird. Now, Roger Smith is somebody who was a parole officer, but had Manson as literally his only parolee that he was supervising. Most parole officers have like 100 to 250 parolees that they oversee. Uh, Manson just had, Roger Smith just had the one. And Roger Smith was a known, um, uh, he had a PhD in pharmaceuticals and was like a sociologist who had just recently started working as a uh, parole officer um, and just kind of said that he was doing it part time. Now, Roger Smith would go on to become the foster parent to Manson's first kid. Uh, he had he had a kid with one of the women in the family mm -hmm. and, and his parole officer uh, adopted the kid and raised him, which is kind of a conflict of interests it's it's not something that really uh normally happens or should yeah. happen for lots of different reasons but uh that just kind of exemplifies the, the relationship that they had <laughs> hang on a second i got dogs acting like dogs <laughs> your dog's mad <laughs> yeah um so yeah so he uh so yeah manson was a bad dude but he wasn't the drug thing was all kind of new to him and uh, it seems that he was brought to San Francisco deliberately to um, kind of infiltrate the hippie movement up there and build the family because that's where the family was built. It was a collection of people that he had met in the Haight-Ashbury area. And then they kind of did their thing 
and uh act, and and once again like getting arrested and like running in trouble with the law but n- n- charges never stuck mm-hmm. um roger smith was always petitioning for uh manson to be able to leave state and for them to go places uh he had filed a lot and this is all paperwork that the guy you know that wrote the book tom o'neill had found he had he had petitioned the parole board to let manson leave the country because he really wanted him to go to mexico for some reason and it's because they were trafficking drugs for the cia allegedly that part who knows but there's lots of theories as to why. But, there, you know, the thing about Manson and, and the Manson family is that they were all criminals. They were always getting caught doing shit. Right. Yet they were always getting probation. And they were always breaking parole. And they were never facing the consequences for it. Um, so these were criminals, right? Uh, and that was, that's something that um, the meta topic of drugs here for this month and how it kind of factors into this is you know a lot's been made about his use of LSD in the MK Ultra program, um, and we'll we'll kind of define where that stuff intersects in a minute. But it wasn't just LSD um, that was at play here; it was also the combination of LSD and methamphetamines. And okay. it it was seeing what ha- okay what happened. We know what happens with LSD now, right? right. The MK Ultra program started in the fifties. 10 years later, by the, by the end of the 60s, they knew pretty much everything they needed to know about the drug. But now they wanted to see what happens when you start mixing it with shit, right? What happens when you have a lot of sex on acid? What happens when you... And that's... What was that, what was that thing I told you about? Operation Midnight Climax? Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. so... Yes, so what that, is this? <laughs> that, was, that was... And once again, this is documented. This isn't in part of the fucking documents that were unveiled. You know, the, the, the MKUltra stuff that they found. That was a, a program where they set up brothels in San Francisco. And they would drug the people. The, so you ever see like Cat House, like that show on HBO? Yeah, I know okay, about so this. You, I know you know how you go to the bar and then you go upstairs and you fuck? So at the bar, they were slipping them. They were microdosing them acid. And then, then they would go upstairs and then the women would try to get information from these men who were just like, some of them were just like businessmen or whatever. But it was, it was uh, an experiment to see the correlation between sex and drugs. You know what I mean? Like, okay, what, what happens if you... We know what happens if you give people acid and you lock them in a fucking dark room for three days. They lose their fucking mind. Okay. Case closed. Well, what happens if you give people acid and then you, you have a hooker bang their brains out for six hours? How susceptible are they? Yeah. How, you know what I mean? How to suggestion, how much can you get them to divulge? How much can you get them to go against, uh, maybe th- agree to do things actually that they wouldn't normally do because they have hangups or that, are morally irreprehensible, you know? Um, and that was what that program was about, Midnight Climax. And that was three years before Manson even got to San Francisco. Yeah. Right? That was like 1964. He gets there in 1967. So um, all that stuff was in play. And what happened was his parole officer had, who, like I said, was was a, uh, was like a scientist, got got involved with this other uh doctor and they had opened up a free clinic in the Haight Ashbury uh area. And this clinic, which is where Manson went for his parole visits, was also um it provided uh abortions and um uh, in like penicillin and like, you know, cause everyone's got us, you know, they're getting fucking the clap and shit left and right. And people have malignant nutritions and people are ODing, ODing and all this stuff. It was free health services for the community. Right. Okay. And, uh, they, they did it partially as, uh, like philanthropy, like to help the community, but they were also studying the fuck out of everybody that walked in there because at the time they, they, you know, acid it kind of like it started as like i want to say we got it from the swedes um it's not an american invention like it was acid was invented like in europe and when we found out what the russians were doing with it uh, we wanted to start our own experiments and somehow we got like the formula from the swedish people for some reason i don't know i could be wrong about that but i don't think i am um but i don't have the specifics either so 
we start doing our experimentations, right? And Timothy Leary was one of the scientists that was responsible for that. He's the one that got the recipe out and kind of released it to the public. Also, there was people in this uh, that we there's it's been suggested that you had people like Manson who were getting basically an unlimited supply from it of it from the CIA and were dumping it into the community to see what was going to happen. They were so afraid of the counterculture movement at the time that they were trying to study what happens because you got to remember too, like in the sixties for the first time you had middle eight, like middle class white kids doing drugs in large numbers. Right? Yeah. Who yeah. was doing drugs before then? Who was doing heroin in the fucking twenties? Who was doing, who was smoking weed in the fifties? It wasn't the kid next door. It was miscreants. It was, it was bad kids. It was, Okay. It was lo- lower class people. Right. And now you saw drugs become commonplace and you saw, our, you know, people like our parents doing or whatever, you know, and it was like, it was scaring the shit out of the government. You had this anti-war movement. You had, you had the Black Panther Party supported by white people. Oh my God. Racial division had been fucking something since day one in this country. And now you had white middle class kids helping black activists what the fuck like like you gotta imagine these older people these people that were born in like 1910 you know these these 50 year old generals and 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 whatever you know scratching their heads saying what the fuck is going on and a lot of them were legitimately convinced that there was russian interference that they're the only way you could explain kids from the suburbs smoking weed in 1967 is because of the russians because <laughs> that's well, the only it does possible, make sense because that's people, what was going on at that time i mean and that was that you got to understand like think about what a what a huge generation like like conceptually like a, a huge generation gap there is between those kids and their parents yeah you know what i mean and like that was their that was the only conceivable explanation to the youth counterculture movement and everything just started moving too fucking fast. You had rock and roll, you had drugs, you had civil rights, you had women's rights. You had all of these things happening in the course of like 10 fucking years. And they're just trying to see like, where is this all going? What's going to happen next? What happens if they win? What happens if we let this happen in small, in small areas? What if, what if we abandon California yeah. and we leave it to Hollywood and we leave San Francisco to the hippies? What's going to happen? What's going to happen here? What's going to happen there? What's going to happen if if we let, you know, the hate Ashbury, we let these people all walk around and do acid and do communal living, which sounds way too much like communism for these people. What's going to happen? And um, so there's all these studies going on. And there's all these people that are, you have the CIA, but you also have people that are medical professionals, that are sociologists, that are physicians, that work for the government, that are are getting funding from them to do these experiments and they're all happily doing it because this is they're going to write their dissertation dissertations on this this is going to be the coursework that's going to define their career as a doctor right um so you have all of that going on now across the hall from that free clinic is another is an air force colonel who uh is retired and he runs just around the corner a flat that is like a, is like a crash pad where like anybody can stay where people can come and live for as long as they want provided he lets his grad students study them okay that air force general has connections to the mk ultra program that air force general was the one of the last people to talk to jack ruby alive okay before jack ruby lost his mind and fucking after he had been arrested yeah for, all right so like that guy has a long long history with the mk ultra program and that's where they think that stuff all comes into play because manson's in that area at the time his parole officer is working across the hall from one of the big wigs of the mk ultra program that has connections to jack ruby and has connections to all this shit there he manson's bringing his people in there he's recruiting members of his family from uh from that area in the community you know what i mean and he's not just picking people it's you know because some people take acid and they have positive 
experiences. Some people take it and they have negative experiences. And this is all stuff that they realize with rats is that there's some stuff that propels some get propelled towards violence. And a lot of it has to do with like environmental factors, living in close proximity, crowded, crowding, you know what I mean? And they're simulating city environments. Like if, if we had a bunch of people on acid in a city, like in, in an apartment building, how is that going to play out different than in suburbia where everyone's spread out? Right. Yeah. An apartment, you got people across the hall, you got people above you, people below you. People get psychotic. They fucking kill each other. Yeah. Right. What happens when you have an, but you're in a farm and you're spread out and there's all this space, things go a lot smoother. Well, what happens if you give someone acid and okay, that's one thing. And then you fucking shoot them up with methamphetamines. What do they do? They turn into fucking murder machines. Oh, yeah. So that was, that was what they think Manson's connection was, was that his parole officer saw something innate in him, saw something that he already possessed, right? And they taught him hypnosis. They taught him all this shit. They gave him the drugs. They said, build, they gave him the funding. They gave him carte blanche to come and go as he want. They never got arrested for anything. We, last last show, we talked about the uh, the stolen car ring that he was running on yes. to spawn rants. Yeah. That's why he walked away from that. And that's why they didn't pull the, that's why they didn't arrest him right away either. Is because they realized, oh my god, he fucking killed Sharon T. <laughs> like it got it got too big, and they were like, oh, what the fuck are we gonna do? Because at the end of the day, it's not like the president's running this shit. It's a couple rogue CIA people, and the thing just spirals out of control. And there's you try to cover your ass, you try to cover your ass, and then things kind of reach a point, a critical mass, where you're like, okay, we need to figure out how this is going to go public. We need to get in front of the story. How are we going to do this? Well, oddly um, enough, we've seen that happen. Uh, we've seen that roll out with the coronavirus in China. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, that shit happens a lot. Um, you don't always kill, you know, Sharon Tate, but you know, <laughs> it does happen. Things get away from these people. Now, so okay, okay, so, but so what you are kind of saying does kind of back up the claim that this girl was making to to release him, um, because she was trying to show when you look at that website. Um, which you know now we know what it is. We'll link it. Um, it does kind of show more. Um like in-depth evidence of like who these people are that were involved with the case who the witnesses were how these people were paid off all kinds of stuff so um but going back to what you were saying now so they they fucked up right and this thing kind of um created its own monster first of all meth is a hell of a drug pat have you ever done meth before <laughs> i have not uh, you yet. have not um i have not either um, however, I do know that it can make you, it makes you literally fucking insane. Like it changes. There's like a threshold of only so much meth that you can do before you are, you are mentally ill for the rest of your life because of being on meth. And like, it's, it's completely irreversible. Once you hit that point, it does make you insane. Um, but <laughs> I don't remember what I was saying. Um, that's all the meth I used to do. Um, <laughs> I was what were we talking about oh we were talking about all these ties so so they kind of you know saw these criminals right they're these already no good people it's just the same as like a serial killer targeting a prostitute nobody's gonna miss them nobody's gonna notice you know people they're, they're, they're the scum of the earth right so this made these people really easy targets um but then it got so big that they didn't really have a choice but what does hollywood kind of have to do with all this you were you were kind of talking about some really troubling shit when it came to like well, yeah, so after um I think they did everything they could do in San Francisco and the also, you know, you're talking about like this the this Air Force colonel that had the office across from the um right. free clinic. <laughs> I mean, people like he didn't these are like, you know, like I said, 40 and 50 year old career military people yeah. that try to like grow their hair out and wear like tie-dye shirts. And people are like, whatever, pig. Like, yeah, kind of, it wasn't it wasn't the perfect cover. Sure. Um, but the free clinic kind of had more success because people needed those services anyway. Yeah. And they even say that, like, his flop house that he was trying to run, it didn't really go so well. And even if, you know, and you also have a lot of, like, you know, sex and drugs happening. And even if you weren't necessarily all about the drugs, you know, a lot of these people were still all about the sex. And you had a lot of free women and, and women being you know, open with their bodies and or drugged out of their fucking minds and having no idea what they're doing. Right. Um, and the other thing that happened is that they had like a, uh, there was two incidents. One, one, they had like a, uh, like a, like a sex party or something. 
and one of the one of the people that was there was like a 16 year old boy that was underage and happened to be the kid of a uh, uh, San Francisco County whatever sheriff. So he goes home and he's all fucked up, and he tells his parents what happened. And I'm, a, you know, they, I don't know what they gave me, and there was naked men there and all this kind of stuff. And his parents wig out, and his his dad come, you know, they come in and they throw these fuckers in jail. And this is a hard one to get out of, right? Because right now they've been getting like, you know, they get caught with a stolen car and they walk free the next right. day, right? Or they get caught with possession, they go free the next day. Something like this, you yeah. know, not so much. Uh, and the other thing is they had, they had this bus that they drove around in and they all got super fucked up and passed out and pulled the bus over and then fell asleep in the ditch on the side of the road next to the bus. And they were all naked and, uh, the police come across it and they see all these people passed out on drugs and they find a baby, a one week old baby in the bus that was like malnourished and had sores and was dirty and stuff. And. Once again, the hammer gets thrown down. You can only fucking push this shit so far. So basically, they all got, they all went in front of a judge, miraculously all got parole, even though some of them were, were violating parole at that point. Uh, and at that point, they had to move back to LA County because that's where like the, their, a lot of their charges stemmed from. So they go back to LA County and they move out to Spawn Ranch. And that's where things get weird. And there's a couple different theories as to why. So this book doesn't have all the answers. Let me just say that too. Okay. Um, but it, you know, it, it definitely has new information, but it does not offer a definitive like timeline of events as to what happened. And, you know, it, it's kind of like, it's just more info mm -hmm. uh, because nobody really knows the truth as to what happened. Cause it's, there's so many fucking moving parts to it, but so they think that possibly, you know, being in San Francisco kind of grounded everything. And um, they were part of a society and a culture, one that was more open and forgiving and you could walk around all fucked up and there wasn't so much ridicule or anything like that. And they had access to all these free services and shit. So they, they lived a lot better as opposed to they moved down to LA and Spawn Ranch and now they're isolated on this old cowboy movie set and they're left to their own devices. They can do whatever the fuck they want. And they're also living a lot harder. And they have to turn to crime more just to survive, their, just to kind of keep their lifestyle afloat. Right. Okay. But at the same time, they're, uh, they have all these women. And that's the thing that kind of keeps... That's how Manson was able to... I mean, he had these... Obviously, these women were all under con his control. And, you know, imagine you're a guy that's got a dozen girls with him that will fuck whoever tell you tell them to on command. So, like, you know, I don't know, like anybody, you know, if, if you find the right person where you can just say, hey, you know, I, I want you to do this for me. Uh, I want you to invite me to this party or I want you to, you know give us free drugs or I want you to do this and, and you can bang two or three of these girls all night. If you want that works with a lot of people. Hmm. Right. I have experience uh, with this. So. Yeah. So like you, <laughs> yeah. you talk about, you talk about like how the whole Dennis Wilson thing happened. Yeah. Pussy. Right. Or the, the Terry Felcher thing. Who was the, who was the, um, the record producer pussy. Why, why were they hanging out with Warren Beatty or why were they going to these fucking parties? Why were they let through the front door? Pussy. I mean, as like, wild as it sounds, it does work. He had a lot of it. And he had these women did whatever he told them to do. And people started to become fascinated with this cult that he had. And they admired him. And he, and like I said, he, he was a charismatic guy. He knew how to hold an audience. And, you know, hey, how, how much pussy do I have to give you for you to just give me a, let me record a record? A 45, an A side and a B side. Come on. You do hundreds of these a year. Let me do one. And and you want to get fucked for like 10 days straight? Like whatever. We'll make it happen. Yeah, it works. You know what I mean? Wow. That's true. I guess I'd never really thought about that before, even though, like I said, as you know, I have experience with that, but it does work. <laughs> wow. 
that is that's very interesting i'm over here just listening so you know here here's my thing about what i'm hearing so far about this book i would i would like to read it i think it sounds very interesting um mk ultra in general um you know especially when you're talking you know we found twenty thousand documents how long is this book pat how do you know how many pages this book is well it's actually close to 600 but the uh the narrative part is only about 400 and uh 430 right and then there's about 170 which is all um a note you know notes and stuff and like references and, and you know footnotes and where the information came from and all that stuff fact checking right and so so i know when we did the mk ultra episode i wanted to put down the um like a direct link to where you can find the the file the files the documents again there's not twenty thousand pages twenty thousand documents and those individual documents can be you know whatever i mean they could be right. three pages they could be 60 pages you know right. most of the time they're they're you know the latter <laughs> and so you got twenty thousand separate documents and this guy's kind of you know probably went through a good portion of them which is why it's taken him you know 20 years to write this book um you know just imagine sitting down to read all that so there's so much to it and then not just that this is just the things these this is just project mk ultra and there are th offshoots of that project so when you sit down and and look at everything that was kind of happening and you put it all in like this timeline and then you hit the point where you're talking about the um i'm not gonna say coincidences the ties to the manson family and how it all kind of was happening at the same time in the same area i guess what you have to ask yourself at that point is if you believe in coincidences or not either this was just a crazy happenstance of accidents or it wasn't <laughs> and you know i think that um you know i i think when you do really start digging and looking and that's just that's just talking about the time does that go into the trial at all does it talk about the different people that were involved in the trial and whatnot well it talks the main antagonist for the book is the prosecuting attorney attorney the which DA, is the, which he's the one that wrote the helter skelter, helter -Skelter yeah right. because he is um he is kind of the corrupt architect of this cover story and obviously he was doing it because he was probably told to but he's the one that manipulated the evidence to come up with this cover story in the first place um but it's it's doubtful that he was working alone or of his own um volition like he was obviously put up to this by somebody but uh yeah so he's he's kind of uh it, it talks about that but it doesn't it doesn't do like a day-by-day -day trial thing it talks about you know what certain witnesses said on the stand more importantly what witnesses weren't called um because they offered conflicting viewpoints um and how just kind of some of the information was maligned to paint specific pictures that backed up the health skeleton theory right right which of course he had a horse in the race i mean he went on to write a book and that book netted him a lot of money and <laughs> right i mean that was his career defining uh career defining uh moment in his life but you know he tried to run off run for office twice after that and both times defeated because of scandals that broke in the middle of the elections and the scandals involve him like trying to fucking beat well he beat the shit out of his mistress to the point where she uh trying to get her to miscarry um wow. which is a fucked up way to go about things <laughs> trust me i know and uh the other one was um he was uh he had broken into somewhere i don't know some shit with the fucking cops but i he wasn't a good dude and um you know he kind of he he came up with a lot of the stories that he came up with to protect some people in hollywood and to protect you know the government shit and he never touched upon any of the parole violation stuff never brought in manson's old parole officer who was this guy that was a cia spook um and doctor and stuff so no he 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 very much you know kind of uh created the sham trial just to make sure that things went off the way they wanted to go off which painted a larger picture of youth gone wild and the dangers of drug use which is ultimately what they wanted to do you know yeah 
Well, right. And so, and again, so that leads, you know, back in a, like I said, kind of where I started this was because the claim that old uh, Afton Burton was making was that they were just using the Manson case and Charles Manson himself as an example to make an example out of them. And it sounds like there may have been something to that, um, you know, because they didn't want people to, um, to know that this could not only be, you know, just, they, they still wanted people to see that this was a bad thing, that there were, there was this bad movement happening and the drugs were out of control. And, you know, meanwhile, they were the ones feeding the drugs to everybody. And still to this day, the government has their hand in, in the drug trade. And you're, you're silly if you don't believe that they do. <laughs> right. I think, I think basically like the Reader's Digest version of what this book proposes happened is, uh, you know, the government funded the Manson family initially it created the manson family to study it to see how it could be formed you know they didn't create charles manson necessarily he kind of existed yeah and there's plenty of bad men in the world they don't need to make more of them uh but they found this bad man that fit whatever psychological criteria they had on their list they you know gave him resources they gave him enough rope to to kind of make this thing happen and uh he did it and they studied it and it basically got out of control yeah. and um you know it uh it, and then they tried to cover it up which is what they did so then know? the claim is that what so they let them get away with all these penny crimes for so long because they because they needed to because they were there well, and then there's also the chance that you know once they once they got in bed with manson and they started letting him do this he could have blown the whistle now they could have threatened to kill him or they could have threatened to do this or, or killed you know other members of the family or like look if you talk because like yeah he wasn't allowed to talk on stand at his trial but like it's not exactly like the dude couldn't have didn't have the public's ear after that you know what i mean there was plenty of opportunity for him to kind of go public and and get a message out to the press um and he never did that he may have made cryptic allegations but he never went on the record and said i you know i was working for the fucking cia and my parole officer yada 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 um and this is why I was let go. He just, it was more, I, f I feel like he probably had more power dangling, threatening to tell the truth than if he had just done it. Okay. Uh, now, why they didn't have him killed in jail like they, like so many other people, I don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe he was just too popular for that to have happened. But then again, look at, they killed fucking Epstein and no one really gives a shit about that anymore. I know. <laughs> no, That's old news. <laughs> That's old ass news. <laughs> and they, uh, it blows my fucking mind. Maybe we'll cover that. I don't know. One of these days. But okay. I don't so, think there's, I think everyone kind of knows that one already. That'll be a quick episode. If you ever need to, to dude, fill 20 minutes of podcast. How many people don't know whose names are actually on the flight logs that like, you can go and read by yourself? Like you can, re you can look at them and see whose names are. Now, some of them are abbreviated with initials. So you don't, you, you can't really, it's not really, really fair to assume that it's so and so. But some of them are very clear on who, who. Like is, is T Hanks Tom Hanks or is it like you know teresa hanks like right. his sister-in-law i don't know <laughs> right it could, yeah it could be <laughs> Wait, for, Pat, if it's his sister-in-law they wouldn't have the same last name now if it's his brother's wife oh wait that's true. jesus mind. christ i gotta explain i gotta walk you through this <laughs> maybe i got high today i don't know i'm sick with COVID. <laughs> i don't know something I, whatever i'm trying to make some uh excuse up but <laughs> anyway 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 the point <laughs> is is that you can you can read those flight logs yourself so when you see this dumb shit and you're like oh so and so was on that flight and that's like but but they weren't though like you can go read it and then they're like and then you mention like who was on the flight and, and it's all crickets and it's like you you can go and see it yourself anyway uh, um back to what i was saying um the point that i was i was going to make before we started talking about epstein um so do you think that based off of what you read from the book um, because this is kind of a kind of a big question when it comes to Manson. Do you think that the family went to Sharon Tate's house to take out her and or Roman Polanski? So because um, hold on, because the claim is that they thought that Terry Melcher lived in that house and he did previously. The Melcher or Felcher. Maybe I'm thinking of gerbils up the ass. Melcher. Melcher. Right. Yeah, Terry Melcher. <laughs> see i did a little bit of research i don't mind i don't myself a little bit um but no so they you know so that's the claim was that they went to the wrong house and killed the wrong people no one one theory that i uh that i that that's in there was that there was um a 
you know, they had, they were at that house and, um, some of the Manson people were there for a party a couple of weeks previous with, uh, some drug dealers that were also had CIA ties. Mm-hmm. Um, and that they didn't really like these guys. They were kind of like bad, you know, everyone kind of just tolerated them, not the Manson people, but the drug dealers. Um, and they were kind of just like buffoons, but they were selling drugs and whatever. You need someone to sell dope at the party. So you let them in, but they OD'd like on hair. One of the guys OD'd on heroin mm-hmm and passed out so he's in like you know that fucking heroin coma thing from like uma thurman in uh pulp fiction (laughs) and that jay sebring and this other guy who was one of the victims of the murder he was this like polish immigrant that was uh selling lots of mdma um and like just living at the polanski house that they took turns like raping him in front of everyone at the party and um and then like threw him out on the front lawn and uh that there might even be like videotape of this too or like or like film wow. yeah and um so he wakes up and his his drug buddies well his his the, his two buddies who are like this like drug ring one of them has like very strong um cia ties they uh take him to like wherever they're living at the time and they chain him to a tree so when he wakes up, he doesn't run back there and kill these fucking people. And um, he wakes up and he's freaking out and his like belts cut. And he could tell that like, you know, he got gang banged in the ass. Sure. And, like he's like, uh, he's like wigging out and shit. And they tell him like, look, dude, they were all getting ready to go to Jamaica the next day to like location scout a movie quote unquote but like clearly they were smuggling drugs but sure. like that's like the story now is like yeah and then the next day we left for jamaica and they were in jamaica when the murders happened yeah however they knew the manson family they had connections with them through mama cass mama ellie uh, cass elliot of the mamas and the papas who i guess was like this huge like who was like this huge surveillance figure for them for the government during the time because she would have parties all the time in california and it's like where a bunch of like drug things intersected or some shit i don't know that's another fucking story for another podcast (laughs) but uh that they they think that um they because they sold drugs to manson and they knew manson and they had a relation like a, a criminal relationship with them that before they skipped town they went to chuck and said hey can you make this happen and that's why they went and did that and that and that because so many people were at that party and saw what happened that when they turned up dead they knew that it it was like that's why everyone like you know kind of was like oh my god like they deserved it or they had it coming or they knew that this had something to do with those crazy fucking drug Manson people and the drug dealers and all the drugs and sex and women and all this stuff. Um, so that's, that's a theory that's put forth from the book. And if you don't believe that it was random, which it goes to great lengths to prove that it wasn't, um, then that's the other, that's really kind of like in the vacuum of the, of the Helter Skelter theory dropping out. That's kind of the only thing that's left. Okay. And that's just kind of seedy enough for me to buy you know what i mean like, yeah okay. well i mean just you know? like you know what are the odds like uh roman plansky was supposed to be back home that day and that's why there was a bunch of people at the house i didn't know that yeah he was supposed to be he was supposed to come back home that day and sharon sharon tate was upset because he you know he was delayed he was tidy called her and said hey i'm not gonna be home today and um that's when i think it was sharon tate's sister i don't remember she called over a couple of people to go kind of keep her company until roman got back and so while he's gone they you know that's that's when the you know the murders took place also um manson himself has said that he was he was just at that house um two weeks prior to the murders happening so he knew right. that terry melcher didn't live there anymore well he also said that he was there after it happened um and that he left they 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 switched the crime scene around um that's something he went on record to say 
and that he left sunglasses there or something. He, he they did a bunch of they moved the bodies and uh they did some shit just to make the crime scene look more confusing. Um and uh yeah. And they think that when he did that, he was with uh hang on a second. Yeah, I'm almost done. Yeah, we'll go. We'll go. I'm almost done. All right. That's my beautiful wife. My beautiful busty wife. <laughs> yeah, we're recording right now. Everyone knows now that you got you know. everybody knows that you got big bosoms. <laughs> oh. Um Yeah, so that's so yeah, he was he knew about it and uh I forget the uh, the guy that he had with him that he went back there with, but it was somebody that called Terry before the police did and let him know that there was murders at that house. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of hinky shit with that. And like I said, I defer back to it was a, it, you know, he they didn't go. It wasn't an accident that they went there and they went there probably because they they could have been contracted by this other group um because there was really no other reason to do it you know what i mean yeah yeah well i guess i just wanted to see if there was any type of speculation so after um you know after 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 reading what you've read what what do you think is the likely story here do you think that manson just ran some crazy cult do you think that the helter skelter thing holds water do you think that this new theory is where it's at what do you think no, I definitely agree. I I definitely drink the Kool Aid that the book is is saying because it ties into stuff that we already know about MK Ultra. Yeah. You know, I think that it was a program. It was a social experiment gone awry, and they gave this guy too much freedom to do what he wanted to do, and you know maybe a lot of it had to do with the girls. You know, I think people severely underestimate the power because it's all guys running this shit. There's no, there's no like female agents at that point or like female like director. No. Of yeah, fucking, women were still at home you know. with kids and, <laughs> yeah. you know, things like that. It's That's all guys. Thing. Yeah. It's all guys. And then you have like these barely legal fucking 16, 17, 18, you know, year old women that are just, you know, attractive and banging anything that moves or whatever well and during like the women's rights you know movements and things like that yeah absolutely i mean that's... yeah so i think it was just uh it was the 60s and this was you know whether or not the uh the cia wanted to admit it they were kind of infected with the chaotic nature of the era anyway and as much as they as much as they were trying to find ways to reestablish control and discredit the counterculture movements they it didn't work like that they kind of they looked into the abyss and the abyss looked back at them and they became what they were trying so hard to to guard against and i mean i think it begs the greater philosophical question of like you know what is control and sometimes you know the more you try to establish and the more you try to um maintain control sometimes the more you lose control of things and that you know chaos is kind of seen as a negative force in the universe mm -hmm. but it's it, it's in a lot of ways it's a positive one and, and when destruction occurs is when you try to uh prevent chaos in some way you know so i don't know i i think that i i buy it i buy the book you know and the, and like i said the book is very careful to not make claims that it can't back up there's a lot of things that it can back up and it doesn't try to it doesn't claim to have the definitive answer of the truth because there's it's probably too big and too weird and too complicated. You would need three of these fucking books, which I'm not gonna and read. It happened so long ago now at this point. I mean, does it even matter, you know? I yes. I well, first of all, for historical context, yes, I think it matters. I think definitely because I see it it's it's interesting all the shades of what you see happening in our in our own mm -hmm. uh government. Not when so the DA that uh that's kind of the antagonist of the book when when he realized that the author was writing this book about him and had collected the evidence that he had uh he wrote letters to uh the press and the publisher of the book to try to discredit the author by calling him a pedophile wow yeah because he was a gay the, the author's gay and he was uh involved in a much hit a much younger partner but like 
<laughs> the author's like 40 and he was banging a 29 year old dude like that's not that bad you know what i mean like that's pretty normal for gay people i don't know how many gay dudes you know but like <laughs> they, they usually go younger you know um so like that's not like scandalously imbalanced but once again oh how interesting you know we fall back on the pedophile thing when we try to discredit somebody or, or ruin their image or when you want someone shunned and locked away okay you know um it just the, the russian collusion oh the only way that the youth counterculture movement could exist is with russians fixing it russians must be interfering yeah you know and how much does that sound like the election the only way trump could have won is if the russians fixed the election well, no we still blame the russians for everything don't we no dude it's your cra- it's your crazy fucking uncle <laughs> that's why <laughs> Ta- you know what i mean like and that's the thing is that like there's it's it's interesting cuz like there's a lot of this stuff has not gone away and it's you're hearing the same shit and you're seeing the same tricks and that's that's the thing with establishment is that they they fear creativity they fear change so they don't learn any new games you know yeah i agree with that i agree with so, that i think it is yeah. I think it is relevant to be able to learn you know we say that so that history doesn't repeat itself and you know here we are but then again we only have half the story we don't even and you know let's let me just remind everybody again most most of the mk ultra documents were destroyed right you know we'll never have the full story now at this point and um you know that's and and most of the uh probably whatever missing pieces there are to this book i mean you probably could have found in those documents and that's why they destroyed that you know they probably we've talked about maybe they destroyed the worst ones first you know and yeah. that, that might have well, been those might have been the worst ones yeah the stuff they found were off i mean it talks about that and that was that was crazy too because we had just um we we had just covered this in mm-hmm. the episode but yeah what they found were uh those all those documents that, that were not destroyed those were financial documents so it, it, it wasn't the really cool like case files like you know uh observation report stuff right. it was just the financial stuff however that you could piece that together and there right. was enough damning uh information in that to kind of get them what they needed. tell you a story right yeah exactly right but it, no in no way a complete story um and there, there's way more that, like you said, we'll never know. Yeah, that, yeah, that we just never will know. I, I just, I do find it very interesting. Um, you know, I think it is a, I think it is a possibility. Um, you know, either way, Manson's, you know, he's dead now, right? I mean, he never, um, he can never talk, but he, he always maintained his innocence. Um, but and he did try to speak, but he was always silenced and you know couldn't really talk. Or like he would do these interviews and you know when he did do the interviews and everybody knows you watch him you know crazy uncle charlie he starts going off on these tangents and is that because like he's been kind of made insane because of the experiments that might have taken place or you I, know there could be some of that i mean there's definitely um they proved basically that the mk ultra stuff like like the 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 author was interviewing somebody he goes you know is charles manson like this textbook case of mk ultra gone wrong and they're like no it's the textbook case of mk ultra gone right like this is exactly what they were but, trying to yes, fucking do right you know it was like um, the chills. <laughs> yeah and like and like that um i don't th- i think just the the after effect of of what he went through back then i don't think that like they're still micro dosing him in a cell or that like, no i know I, th- right. I think he's I fucking nuts and like he was probably nuts when they pulled him out of jail like he had a, right. the, he the dude had it yeah he there was like i said he was a plenty bad enough dude before any of this stuff happened um before when he was just a a, a, a criminal fucking raping people and and, and stealing I mean, cars he and did shit. sound crazy but the fact of the matter is is that somehow he was able to win these people over and if that same person was the person that you see on the fucking abc and in interviews and shit like how could someone like that win all these people over he had to have been a different person then he was well he, i he think yeah that crazy that you know what i mean he, he did but it wasn't like he had a way to do it where people understood what he was saying was he, he was younger he didn't have a swastika carved in his head it was the 60s it was san francisco he was probably a little bit more coherent he wasn't in an orange jumpsuit he had fucking been yeah. out in the sun like yeah i think it was you, you know you you kind of turn back the clock a little bit and you you realize it's a different time and even then he seemed fucking weird yeah like trust me there was plenty of people 
that like got the fucking creeps from him that oh, were yeah. like oh no you know like like when he met with uh terry melcher the record producer yeah dennis wilson had fucking vouched for this guy and said you gotta check him out you know he's uh he's uh, uh you know he's got some talent he's written some songs for us and you know he's very charismatic but Malcher met him and was like i can't put this guy on a fucking record you know what i mean like people that were like that were not into like the fucking scene at the time took one look at him and were like yo this dude's bad sauce you know and the crazy thing about it was is that he really like charles manson really was like really talented like his his they're good no listen have you listened to them they're good of course i'm a guns and roses fan i fucking listen to them (laughs) no they're pretty good and so it's like well you know but then again i mean you know how many uh how many artists out there are you know good artists that never make it i mean you know whatever i don't know I'm one it's of them just... <laughs> right I have albums i've mean... albums of house music that hopefully somebody covers one day after one of these days right well, I mean, sex cult dies in a shootout somewhere you know that's just, right that's just the i mean that's just how it, how it goes sometimes but either way with this new perspective go back and listen uh all i'm saying is you know go back and listen to the charles Manson interviews maybe you might catch something that might make more sense in hindsight knowing that he may have been a cia experiment right so but i don't know do you have anything else to add about drugs or mk ultra or charles manson before we wrap up the uh month of drugs here i know it's it's bittersweet this went really well i think overall this uh this month's meta topic it had it was a good series it was a little, little yeah. series that we had going on it's really fun well I, i'm excited you know we're gonna jump into some different stuff you know now following next week in the following month but no this is this has been a lot of fun um we'll probably touch on it eventually another day um because the government's always fucking shit up so i don't yeah. know but okay well i guess uh i guess that's gonna be it then guys with that being said we will see you back here next wednesday